that you wouldn't see this with uh, with a naked eye. So this is a uh, special technology that allows you to uh, to um, identify heat sources, and uh, this is the the, the continual uh, venting of, of methane gas and whatever else is in in the tanks. Flaring as well. Um, the community of Penobscot sees a lot of flaring. Uh, there was flaring in uh, in Elgin as well. So, so one of the things, if there's no infrastructure in place yet, the only thing you know you can really do with the gas when it comes back during the exploration phase is to flare it off. So they're testing its quality, its purity uh, for for market, and so uh, they have to f to flare it off. And there's a number of, of concerns associated with that. Obviously, the burning off of methane and other uh, substances uh, and light pollution. It's a huge, a huge issue in, uh, in, in Penobscot, uh, lighting up the, the night sky. And um, one of the companies that, that works down there um, at an open house recently told community members that they haven't flared in Penobscot in 18 months um, because people were complaining about it and that was, that was his answer. Uh, and they drove home from the open house and there was a, a big flare uh, in somebody's backyard. <coughs> More infrastructure. So this is um, a compressor station. Um, many of you might not know what that is because we haven't been talking about those types of things. But these are huge pieces of infrastructure that need that they are that are needed to um, to pressurize that gas again as it's being shunted into a distribution line. So um, I don't know how many are on this compressor station, but I think it might be the largest largest one in Arkansas, um, and originally there was a lot of concerns around noise uh, pollution uh, with compressor stations. Um, now they're being built with buildings around them to kind of mitigate that. Um, and but but there are still um, uh, venting again, burning off uh, of methane gas and, and other things at these sites. They're a lot of times run on diesel um, diesel engines, so there's a lot of uh, emissions from <coughs> those. So, so this is the state of Arkansas, and um, I like I like to show this because it, it really visualizes kind of what what the infrastructure looks like in this state, and um, our provincial government is is really kind of using Arkansas as a model for how they'd like to see gas developed uh, in New Brunswick, and so I believe there's something like three thousand wells across that kind of sweet spot that like it's called. Um, plus, you know, with each one of those wells, the associated pipeline infrastructure, and then you can see the, the larger gathering and uh, distribution lines that run through the state as well. Can we assume that those go past the border there too as well? Though? Definitely, they go right across, yeah. yeah. And then this one, disruption of quality, to quality of life, is much harder to capture and measure because it's really subjective and it's different for for every everybody, and you know what your experiences are, and what kind of things you value, and what disruptions to those things you would find disruptive. Um, so, like I said, they range from uh, traffic increase in traffic, 600 truckloads just for water being transported into the community of Elgin. A lot of our communities in New Brunswick are obviously rural. They have usually one way in and one way out, or a, you know one road that kind of passes through, so there's one way in. Um, and so that the huge um, increase of, of traffic to that community is something that uh, people, I, I don't think, really expect until, you know, bam, it's, it's there, and there's, there's a truck every six minutes, you know, going by your front window. Um, yeah, so these are just a couple pictures of, of trucks. So trucks are obviously needed for different things, for bringing in the actual infrastructure to to um, build the you know the platforms for the wells, um, the machinery that's needed to drill the wells, the, the fracking equipment that trucks um, that that the that the, uh, the trucks pull in, they back up with all the the pressurized uh, equipment to create to create the pressure on that well, um, the water, the wastewater coming in and out. Um, and I, was just, I just thought this was funny. This was my first day in Arkansas. I didn't really have my, my camera ready yet. And, and uh, the first thing we saw really was this convoy of, of trucks carrying uh, fracking equipment 
down the main street in, in one of these communities, and this guy carrying water just comes out of this gas station and completely cuts us off and then bottoms out on the sidewalk. <laughs> So a lot of people want to know what the regulatory process in, in New Brunswick is for, for shale gas development. There's cats walking around here. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> um, and you know, we feel that there is not an adequate regulatory framework uh, in place to specifically address shale gas development. We don't have a shale gas industry here. We haven't had one, so why would we have a regulatory framework uh, in place that would address the things that come specific to, to this industry. Um, we do have uh, a general oil and gas act, and it does include, um, in New Brunswick we do have general environmental regulations which um, do seem to be kind of being rolled back recently. Um, and so, but they're, they're, they're permit condition regulations. So basically it means that um, none of our acts say up front, you cannot do this. They say, um, you can do this with a permit and conditions placed on that permit. Um, so things like the water course and wetland <coughs> alteration regulation. Um, so in order to work around, and these, these uh, are not specific to the oil and gas industry. These are general regulations that we have in New Brunswick that anybody has to um, go through the process. Um, so you need a permit to work uh, in around specific wetlands. Um, specific protected watersheds, like drinking water source uh, watersheds, uh, around well-filled protected areas, um, and so things like that. But we do not have specific standards or guide, you know, standards uh, for, for for that are specific to shale gas industry. Um, and so, so this process is what what companies have to go through. So they need this license to search is where most companies are at now. So they have a three-year license to search. And at the end of three years, they can decide uh, if they want to you know, continue in the, in the exploratory phase or if they're going to move past that uh, into more detailed um, you know, testing, drilling uh, phases. They need license of occupation agreements with, with private landowners in order to um, access uh, private property. So for example, the seismic line, uh, if it crosses a private property, then the company needs to have a contract with you to, th so that you know the government knows that you've uh, given permission for that. Um, the geophysical license um, is the the license to to start or to start that the geological programs like the, the seismic testing and the um, the uh, you know to insert the, the 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 straws testing you know actually doing things on the ground. Um, they also need a number of, of permits related to water sources and and, and handling of petrol petrol storage licenses. Um, and then we move into well licensing. Um, and then and then the bottom is basically the final phase where a company wants to move into a production uh, production phase. So they've decided at that point that it is economically viable to produce gas from, from the areas where they've been exploring and then they need to uh, create things like gathering stations and, and pipelines so that starts another um, approval process. <coughs> the, um, originally the, the EIA, the Environmental Impact Assessment for New Brunswick, started at that uh, production phase. So we could see exploration happening as it is right now um, without any environmental impact assessment. The Department of Environment increased or brought that forward in the process so um, so companies do have to go through a, an EIA before they want to uh, create a well pad or drill, drill a well. The seismic programs are not included in that trigger for an EIA. So that's why we're seeing uh, a lot of the seismic, the seismic programs starting now without uh, any environmental impact assessment. Um, and so the phased EIA is, is basically uh, at every step of the process, so uh, uh, from creating a well pad to drilling a well down through the line, uh, fracking, uh, that company needs to submit uh, a, a package or their intent, their vision for what uh, that process is going to look like. Then the government 